everybody. My name is Annalisa, and Chris, I'll let you introduce yourself. I'm Chris Vander. I'm your extension educator. <laughs> We're really glad that you guys are here with us today. We are going to have a really, I think, fun experience. A little feedback. Is the music too loud or too soft in the background? Is it okay? Nope, it's fine. Oh, it's we can okay. barely, you can barely okay. hear it. You can barely hear it. Okay. It's better probably that it's soft than, than too loud. I can't, yep. I can't find All right. wax. So we'll get started with, um, I, and just for context, I've got my three kids here also. So you'll probably hear some mutterings in the background um, as we're doing this. They're going to be working on their sculptures today as well. So I want to turn on the thing. We'll get started here with our first slide. Or right, maybe it's our second slide. There we go. Sorry, here we are. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. <laughs> so Chris and I have introduced ourselves. I'd like for those of you who are on screen to introduce yourself as well. If you would please just share your first name, um, your club, just so we can kind of know where you are in the county and why you chose the kit that you did. Okay. And I'll begin just to give you an example. So my name is Annalisa. We're part of the Mayor Riverside Club. And I chose, well, I actually chose two. I ordered two kits. So I, I chose a bear and I also chose the orca. I'm only going to be working on one of these today, though. Okay. And then I'll pass it around to whoever else is out there. Searsha, if you want to go next, you're welcome to. Uh, my name is Searsha. I'm part of the Carver Coyotes Club. And I joined because it sounded interesting. Okay, and which animal did you choose? And I chose a wolf because oh. I, it looks a lot like my dog. <laughs> Very cool. Good. Thank you, Sirsha. How about you, Nora? Um, my name is Nora. I'm not sure what club I'm in because I just changed clubs. And I don't remember what the new one is. And I chose the wolf. I don't know why. I just thought it was cute. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Is Sarah next? I'm Sarah. And I chose the orca because I thought it was cool. Cool. And what club are you in? Oh, I'm part of the... And then here's my brother. Hello, I'm John, and the kit that I chose was because I really like wolves. And I'm also part of the Pleasant Valley group. Okay, very good. Welcome to both of you. Glad you guys are here today. Do you three want to introduce yourselves? Now they're all shaking their head. Okay, so <laughs> hey, I've, got, I've got Hayden, Savannah, and Aurora here. You want to introduce yourself? Hold my head in. Whatever. <laughs> okay, go ahead. My name's Savannah, and I <clears throat> choose the chose the the bear and the eagle. Okay. I chose the wolf and the eagle. Hayden. Okay. And Aurora is here too, and she chose the, what did you choose? The bear, bear. and the wolf. Bear and wolf too. So we have a lot of similar animals that were chosen here today, which is great. So as we're working on some of these carvings, we'll be able to talk really easily about the different creatures that we have, we have chosen. So now let's just dive into, uh, I'll just do a quick review of what we're going to be experiencing today. They're going to be interwoven stories and songs, and you can hear a little bit of that music behind me. Um, we'll go through our kits and look at the different parts so that we understand what they're all about. And then um, we have a series of videos that you'll be able to watch uh, because Chris is going to be broadcasting them. And those have various tips and, and tricks for carving successfully. And the company that put this together, the Studio Stone Creative, has done, I think, an amazing job of uh, assembling information to help support us in our process. And so we're gonna lean on them and the, the videos that they've already created pretty heavily. And then we'll talk a little bit about soapstone, some of its properties and uses, okay? 
So let's go, Chrissy, can you shift this to our next slide? I don't know how to do that. <laughs> So first let's begin by getting set up. So if you guys reviewed that information that was sent to you, um, you should have a piece of paper or, or a tarp or a towel or even a plastic bag beneath your surface just to catch dust and drips. You're gonna need a few paper towels or an old towel that can get messy. And there's mine for example. Um, a shallow bowl of water. And that's for dipping your creature in. And we need to dip our creature and our tool in the water consistently to help keep the dust at bay, okay? A pencil or even a permanent marker can be a useful tool as well. If there are certain areas that you want to uh, mark on your blank, your animal or your creature blank, so that you'll file down to that point, okay? And then um, an old cloth or a piece of foil, and then a hair dryer, and those can be set off to the side because those are going to be much later in our work. Okay? That's when we we're getting ready to wax. Right. So now let's let's look at our kits and and the things that are in them. Okay. So you should find if and you may just be unloading your bag and looking at the parts right now, and that's just fine. We've got our hand cut soapstone shape. And also a bear, a wolf, an orca, um, or eagle, whatever creature it is that you have. You've got a carving file. You should have two grades of sandpaper. One is reddish and the other one is yellow. You should also have a polishing wax. And so it's, like, it's almost like a, a long elongated bead of wax. Um, with this kit also came a couple of Q-tips and then a little polishing cloth. And then we'll use the polishing cloth or buffing with the wax later. And then last but not least, you should have gotten an instruction sheet. And that's obviously gonna be different for each of the creatures, okay? And then so just setting up your surface, your work surface, so that you've got the things that you're gonna be using later, like your sandpaper and your wax, your polishing cloth and your Q-tips. Set those off to the side so they don't get dusty, and they'll, but they'll still be at the ready for you, okay? One of the biggest tools that we're going to have to employ here is making sure we're constantly dipping our creature in water. And that helps to keep down that dust. But it also helps to protect you because if you're breathing in that dust, it's not so good for your lungs, okay? And so by keeping your stone and your tool wet, that will help to protect your lungs. And then as far as later, and we'll talk about this in the cleanup section, when you dispose of that water, make sure it's outside or you can even water a plant with it. Just do not dump it down the drain. Your parents will be very unhappy with you for doing that. That sediment can clog um, your drain. And we don't wanna do that, all right? So the other thing is to be, just be mindful where you place your tool. You may notice that your file does have some really sharp points on it. So just be really mindful of where you're setting that. Um, and then we wanna use mostly the flat side to be able to, uh, and work it in a forward and backward motion to move the most amount of stone material. Okay, but first a story. <laughs> okay, so take your animal, your creature in your hand and hold it in your hand. We'll close your eyes and you can hold it in both hands if you like to. Feel the coolness of the soapstone in your hand. Feel the shape of your creature with your fingers. And then listen to this story. And this is a story of all our relations of humans and animals. This is the story of silver fox and coyote create the earth. And this is a Miwok or West Coast native from a Native American tribe. Back then, Silver Fox was the only one living. There was no earth, only water. Silver Fox walked along through the fog, feeling lonely. So she began to sing. I want to meet someone. 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 So 
she sang. And then she met Coyote. I thought I was going to meet someone, Silver Fox said. Where are you traveling? Where are you traveling, Coyote said. Why are you traveling like this? I am traveling because I am lonely, Silver Fox said. I am also wandering around, said Coyote. Then it is better for two people to travel together, Silver Fox said. Then as they traveled, Silver Fox spoke. This is what I think, Silver Fox said. Let's make the world. How will we do that, Coyote said. We will sing the world, said Silver Fox. So the two of them began to sing and to dance. They danced around in a circle and Silver Fox thought of a clump of sod. Let it come, Silver Fox thought. And then that clump of sod was there in Silver Fox's hands. Silver Fox threw it down into the fog and they kept on singing and dancing. Look down, Silver Fox said. Do you see something there below us? I see something, Coyote said, but it is very small. Then let us close our eyes and keep dancing and singing, said Silver Fox. And that was what they did. They danced and sang and beneath them, earth took shape. Look down now, Silver Fox said. Coyote looked down. I see it, said Coyote. It is very big now. It is big enough. Then the two of them jumped down onto earth. They danced and sang and stretched it out even more. They made everything on earth, the valleys and the mountains and the rivers and the lakes, the pines and the cedars and the birds and the animal people. That was what they did way back then. So gently blink your eyes open. Feel your shape in your hand again. Notice if it's taken on any of the warmth from your own hands. And that's actually one of the interesting properties about soapstone is it's very heat resistant. Okay. You can set your creature down and then consider this. Just look at the shape. Look at how there's sharp corners here. And then look up, you can look up at your screen too. There's an, uh, Chris has a picture to show you from that story. And you can see Silver Fox and Coyote chasing around that small lump of earth. Okay. So notice how those animals have really rounded shapes. The shapes that we hold in our hands are very squarish and pointed. So just like those animals and that round lump of clay, Silver Fox works with, we want to bring roundness to our shapes, okay? So you guys might remember hearing in school the story of Michelangelo as he was working with, uh, I think he was creating the statue David. His famous statement was, David was there all along. All I did was reveal it. I removed all of those parts that were not David and then David emerged. So that's what we're gonna be doing a little bit today too, kind of like Silver Fox. We're gonna be shaping our stones and bringing out the shape of our creature. Okay, so whether that's a fox or, or rather a wolf or a bear or an orca, okay? Or an eagle. Or an eagle, you bet. All right, so let's move on now to our how to carve videos. And I think since most everybody is represented in that first category, let's just focus on that one. The North American animals carving the orca, bear, eagle, seal, and wolf. And I'll turn down my music. And you guys can hear. Let me know if you can't. Can tell us. so jumpy. Chris, I can't hear it on my end. Hold on. Okay. All right. Go away, kitty. Carving, and we will 
go from the rough stone that you already have and we're gonna transform it, shape it, sand it, and wax it until it became a unique, beautiful art piece ready for gallery exhibit. Then, this is very interesting, this learning, because we're gonna touch four points. The one is culture culture because actually we have this expression needs to bring our life our experience into whatever medium for us is stone and if you know that Inuit arts are renowned for that and they work with different type of animals and story and play and the exhibit and we know them and a bit like us today you have chosen five animals because they are meaning something. I don't know what it is, but they are meaning something. Maybe it's a sense of family or whatsoever. And the next point is that this mineral is very kind of a, it's like oily and it's a lubricant and it's talk. And this type of stone is used to use for drawing on backboards, it's chalk. We use it as a powder as well in different manners. We do max when we do carve. We do geometry. We go from a square shape to round shape. We do V shapes and we subtract. So there's going to be a lot of stone out, never in, so be careful with that. And lastly, it's a mind and body and heart. So you're gonna bring your creativity, you're gonna be focused, and all that together, all in synchronicity, your creativity, creativity will pop up and you're gonna create a unique piece. So let's go and move on to the next step is the setting. Ciao, ciao. Hello, this is the setting. There's a towel at the bottom, water in a bowl. I have all the piece of stone because I'm gonna teach you all. And you, you have one. Your file, sandpapers, wax, and a polishing cloth. So roll up your, your sleeves and you're ready to start. I will discuss about safety. This file, this is how I like to hold it. In my hand, I put my pointy finger on it like that, one, two, three, hold it tight, and this is pretty safe, very sturdy. We use water to actually keep the dust down, and we will work that way. We wet the stone, we wet the file, and we keep our hands behind the tool. So that way, we are very safe in our way of working. Otherwise, if you put your hands a bit in the front, you can actually scratch your fingers and it may kind of hurt and then we rinse all the dust we clean our workspace and off we work you hold it with your finger tight 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 you see my knuckles are getting white it's because there's strength in that I hold my stone from behind and I push and I push and I rinsed often, and that way, no dust in our nose, we're safe, and we have a beautiful, clean work. Step number one, this is to round the back of your stone, and we the round the back or the body of your stone, Wherever I wet it, we're going to work on those areas. 
So now you will understand exactly what I mean. So you can even dry it with a bit your wet finger, what I'm talking about. Now I'm gonna work only on one because it's gonna be just the same for all of them. So let's say I have the eagle here. I wet my stone, I'm gonna work here in the front on the chest and the wing. I wet everywhere and I will round the wing from the back of the head to the end of the tail. I turn, I will do the chest. I rinse often and now what? I continue on the other side as well from the neck to the bottom. Okay, so now I started to round it and round it and more and more and this is how at the end that could look like. The chest will be very round. We go from far behind and round it and round it and round it. That's how it looks after this rounding. And same for all of the other one. You can see the bear that has been around it. So here, remove a lot of those corners. That is the best trick. Subtraction by by those corners. Now, step number two. So we'll do the nose. Those three animals, they are in the same family. And the idea is to remove a large part of the nose on both sides here and here. So bye-bye here, bye-bye there as well. What I like to do is to use my file as a guide. My file can guide me to say, this is the middle of the nose and I will remove the other corners and also for the length of the nose I can say that the tip of my file is here and I will go as far as here so this is my another guide and then I remove the stone if I were to draw my nose I would say okay I want my nose large like my file on both sides and then this corner will disappear. I want my nose large like my file, long like that file and I go and that goes in the back. And when it's draw, either with a pen or using my file, I slip my animal on the side wet 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 and then i have my tips and, I go. and i remove stone like as thick as the file is cha -cha. you see start to get thinner and the same and more and more until that it gets a bit very thin and then you start to make it a bit pointier rounder slowly and gently and then you have a beautiful nose showing up you decide how large you want it and rinse often so that's for this step for those three animals so I will show you now the orca 
the orca and then we'll do the eagle the orca has a very special nose and if you remember how an orca looks like she has a very round nose so the way i do often i imagine an ice cream cone and it needs to be around like an ice cream cone so then to have that i would maybe draw little corners and say i'm gonna remove those little corners here and here and here as well and here as well so then it's gonna be a bit more round the same way i put my stone on the side and remove those corners a bit like you did for your rounding the body of your animal and slowly you'll see that it starts to be round and you do the same on the other way and then I'll put that here those two works together and then for my ego my eagle has a very pointy nose so I have a choice I can say I'm gonna draw a line like that or a line like that or I can say I'm gonna draw a line like that either way you have a guide you're gonna remove those corners here and then your beak is going to start to be pointy. Put it on the side. There's many ways we can do that. Sometimes I go from the top, from the back of the head, from the chest up, until it gets into a pointy shape. A triangle shape so that's how it works so then we do both sides look dolphin ah it's on its way so I would remove until that I have my beautiful shape and I'm satisfied and off we go so this is the nose step Thank you and bonne chance. Good luck. All right. The next step is the details. It will take about 20 minutes here and we will more material before. Yeah, before we get into details. <laughs> So I think for the time being, let's just pause and um, and I can either turn on some music or maybe Chris can share his story. And then we can just work on rounding out all of our sharp edges on our creatures. Okay. And then probably in about, why don't we give it about 10 minutes and then we can um, see where everybody's at and see if we want to move into the lines for legs and moving into some more of the details, either creating a tail for the, um, the bear or I think the wolf tail wraps around the side of the, the wolf. So seeing how to bring those features into play. Just remember to rinse your stone frequently in your bowl of water and rinse your file and keep that wet and clean. So the bear, my bear face is beginning to look a little bit more like a bear face. You can kind of see how the shape of the nose is, is getting shaped. And then I, I've got mostly just the back rounded here. Um, and I haven't begun to work on the ears, but so work on the belly, work on the legs. And then as, as when you were done with one side, again, make sure you turn it over and work on the other side, okay? All right, 
I'm going to read the story. It's the Cherokee story of two wolves and the power of mindset. The, two, the story of the two wolves is an ancient tale that has been part of the Native American tradition for generations. Although the exact two wolves story origin is unknown, historians typically attribute the tale to the Cherokee or Lenape people. The story of the two wolves has also has several alternative tiles, including the wolves within, which one do you feed, grandfather tells, and the tale of two wolves. The story features two characters, a grandfather and his grandson. The grandfather explains to his grandson that there are two wolves fighting within him, which is an image that serves as a metaphor for the man's inner sense of conflict. The conversation between the two men goes like this. I have a fight going on in me, the old man says. It's taking place between two wolves. One is evil. He is anger, envy, sorrow, regret, greed, arrogance, self-pity, guilt, resentment, inferiority, lies, false pride, superiority, and ego. The grandfather looked at the grandson and went on. The other embodies positive emotions. He is joy, peace, love, hope, serenity, humility, kindness, benevolence, empathy, generosity, truth, compassion, and faith. Both wolves are fighting to the death. The same fight is going on inside you and every other person too. The grandson took a moment to reflect on this. At last he looked up to his grandfather and asked, which wolf will win? The old Cherokee simply replied, the one you feed. So this is a parable that's often told as a reminder of the fight that every human being faces. Regardless of the type of person you are, what kind of life you lead, you will find yourself battling two conflicting emotions at some point in your life. Whether the fight is between anger and peace, resentment and compassion, it is important to recognize the conflicting feelings inside you and to feed the values and choices that matter most. I love that story. Thank you, Chris. I'm looking for my other one. Just hold on. Keep carving, people. next story I have is from um, a project done by at the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh, the uh, story collecting time, and it's an Ojibwe story. And so this is this is an Ojibwe legend that is told um, by Jerry Smith, and it's how the bear lost his tail. Well, I've heard that one. Long, long ago, they were only creatures on the earth. There were birds, bear, deer, mice, everything but people. In this long ago time, all the animals spoke the same language. And just like some people nowadays, they paid tricks on one another and made each other laugh. They also helped each other. So it was with all the animals. One day in the winter when the lakes had frozen, but before the winter sleep, a bear was walking along the lake shore. As he was walking, he came upon Otter, sitting near a hole in the ice with a pile of fish. You've got a mighty big pile of fish there, Bear said. How did you get them fish? Instead of telling how he dove down into the water and caught the fish, Otter decided to trick Bear. You see, back then, Bear had a long, bushy tail. He was very proud of his tail, and all the animals knew it. The way I catch my fish is by putting my tail in this ice hole. Otter explained. 
I wheel it around once in a while so the fish sees it. When a fish bites onto my tail, I quickly pull it up and out of the water. That sure is an easy way to catch fish, Bear said. Do you mind if I use your fishing hole? Otter, laughing behind the bear's back, said, I have enough fish. Use my fishing hole as long as you like. Then Otter picked up his fish and walked away. Bear carefully poked his tail into the ice hole and waited. He waited and waited. Once in a while, he'd wiggle his tail so the fish could see it. Bear waited until the sun began to set, but not one fish even nibbled on his tail. At last, he decided to go home. But when he tried to stand up, his tail had frozen into the ice. He couldn't move. He pulled and pulled at his tail, but it was stuck tight. Finally, he pulled with all of his strength and ripped half his tail. Now, you know why the bear has a short tail. And remember, don't always believe what people tell you. <laughs> Look at mine. So just a gentle reminder, think about how much of the corners you want to take down. Remember these animals in nature don't have sharp or um, completely straight sides. So really bring your carving all the way up toward the center. Remember to dip it often, keep your desk down. And anytime you need to take a break, feel free to, to set your file down, lift your gaze a little bit, just to stretch out your neck, reach your arms high, a twist or turn, whatever you need to do to bring a bit of comfort back into your body, and then you can resume your carving. You might have noticed as you're moving your material with your file, as you go back and forth, you scrub. If it's wet at all, it kind of creates this foamy stuff. Um, it's kind of interesting to think about. Maybe that's why it's called soapstone. Thank you. 
once you get one side shaped or even one leg shaped into a way that you like, be sure to turn it over and work on the other side. Wait, the same color as you? Wait, how come mine is a different color than all three of yours? That all of the stones are a little bit different. I know, but yours are all the same color. Is anybody at a place now where they're ready to start looking at a little bit more of the detail work? You can unmute yourself and say, yes, I'm ready for more tutorials on the detail work. If you, if you want to just keep going on removing the, and softening the corners, then we can take a little more time just to do that. I'm going to just guess based on the quiet that we need more time just to, to stop in the corner. So we'll, we'll keep, just keep working. You guys are doing great. Make sure you continue to wet both your stone and your file, keeping that dust down.
does feel like so. Maybe you can wash your hands with it. Mm. Talking about. Yes. I'm ready to did that. Okay, just make sure you do it evenly. And you may not want to do that. Well, I don't know. We'll see. We're supposed to a little. Oh, okay. But not quite as much. to the point myself where I'm starting to feel that a few of the details um, tips are going to be useful. My bear's face is starting to come together. I still need to give some attention to his ears, but the rest of his body is back and his sides and his belly are rounded. Um, so I think it might be a good idea in case people are getting to that point now where they're ready to start working on details for us to turn on the remainder of that video. She gives some really great tips on how to shape the legs, the ears and the face, and even to create a little bit of a tail, um, particularly for the bear. She also talks a little bit about the, um, the tail fin and the nose of the orca. Okay, we're gonna go to animals with four or two legs because I know that one's going to work. <laughs> Sounds good. I hope. <laughs> I tried. Did it do sound? Where the hell is this? 
Okay, let me know if... Tell me of an animal with four legs, two at the front and two at the back. There we go. Oh. To be a little bit faster, we can do a pre-cut in the front legs and a pre-cut in the back legs. And then we can file all the way through all four legs to make it easier. This is a great way to speed up the process. You can go as deep as you like. It's really your preference. You can stay shallow in the front legs like I did, or you can go deeper in the legs like I did in the back. And this is how quick it is to carve your legs out. Have fun. Please remember to dip your carving in water often to prevent from getting dust. Ah, stop. All right. Um, does anybody, yeah, someone's doing an orca, right? Yes. Flipper. Stop, stop. Jeepers. Now I'm starting to cut into the stone with the edge of the file until I have a little groove. You only need a little groove. You can feel it with the edge of your file in between the flipper. Bring your file back to the middle of the flipper. Now we're going to use the side of the file, the wide side, and we're going to start carving with the wide side not the narrow side. So I'm starting to carve down with the wide side of my file, not the narrow side. As you can see, the shape of the V is starting to take shape. Now I'm going to switch to the other side and do the very same thing. I start carving with the wide side of my file. I will keep carving from side to side until I have the depth that I really want. And this is what it will look like once you're finished. Now I'm going to turn the seal around and do the exact same thing on the front flipper. I'll start with the narrow edge of my file first, and then I'll switch angles, and I will keep carving deeper. It's up to you how big you would like the front flippers. They can be slightly bigger than the back flippers, and they can also remain thin. I'm going to wash it now to clean the dust away. You can play with the shape a little bit more, making the flipper go sideways a little bit more than your other flipper, if you like. On the back flipper, you will notice I have rounded off the edges. You will notice there's a slight indent at the back of the seal. You can use the same technique as before, using the wide side of the file, going from side to side, and turning it over as well. I can also round it off a bit. And now I will do the very same thing on the opposite side. And this is how quick and easy it is to carve your flippers on the seal. Have fun! Okay, we're going to show, am I still on? Yep, we're going to show how to carve the nose on the bear and the seal and the wolf next. I'm pretty sure we've got bear, seals, and wolves out there, so 
hold on, but let me make sure I've got the right one. Rounding off the edge of the cradle and that will be nice and firm. Have fun with your stitching too. Annalisa, would you say that that's probably the similar for the wolf as well? Say it again. Would you say that that looks pretty similar to what the wolf head would look like? As oh no, it's got a different. The, well, the bear and the wolf head are, are relatively similar um, as far as just shaping them, bringing it to a point. Right. You know, that's true really yeah. also the orca, um, except the orca is more rounded and smooth and the, and the bear and the wolf are slightly more sculpted. There's just more facial uh, detail there. Um, in the first video, if you forward to about the 10 minute mark, I think was where they had the details and that gives um, quite a bit of information on lots of the creatures. So that might be a useful spot to go. The first one? The first one that we watched, the first one that's listed on the, the top of the that slide. Whoopsie, whoopsie, stop. <clears throat> No, not that one, this one. Stop. And you want me to forward to the 10 minute mark? Yes, please. You start to make it a bit pointier, rounder, slowly and gently, and then you have a beautiful nose showing up. You decide how large you want it, and rinse often. So that's for this step for those three animals. Oh, maybe we went a little bit too far. I'll show you now. Hold, hold on a second. is to use my file as a guide. My file 
can guide me to say this is the middle of the nose and I will remove the other corners and also for the length of the nose I can say that the tip of my file is here and I will go as far as here so this is my another guide and then I remove the stone if I were to draw my nose I would say okay I want my nose large like my file on both sides and then this corner will disappear I want my nose large like my file long like that file and I go and that goes in the back and when it's draw either with a pen or using my file I slip my animal on the side wet 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 and then I have my tips and, I go. and I remove stone like as thick as the file is cha cha you see it start to get thinner and the same and more and more until that it gets a bit very thin and then you start to make it a bit pointier rounder slowly and gently and then you have a beautiful nose showing up you decide how large you want it and rinse often so that's for this step for those three animals so I will show you now the orca the orca and then we'll do the eagle the orca has a very special nose and if you remember how an orca looks like she has a very round nose so the way I do often I imagine an ice cream cone and it needs to be around like an ice cream cone so then to have that I would maybe draw little corners and say I'm gonna remove those little corners here and here and here as well and here as well so then it's gonna be a bit more round the same way I put my stone on the side and remove those corners a bit like you did for your rounding the body of your animal and slowly you'll see that it starts to be round and you do the same on the other way and then I'll put that here those two works together and then for my eagle, my eagle has a very pointy nose. So I have a choice. I can say I'm gonna draw a line like that, or a line like that, or I can say I'm gonna draw a line like that. Either way. You have a guide, you're going to remove those corners here and then your beak is going to start to be pointy on the side. There's many ways we can do that. Sometimes I go from the top, from the back of the head, from the chest up until it gets into a pointy shape, a triangle shape. So that's how it works. So then we do both sides. Look, Dolphin. Ah, it's on its way. So I would remove until that I have my beautiful shape. And I'm satisfied and off we go.
So this is the no step. Thank you and bon chance. Good luck. <laughs> Oh, here's. <laughs> Can we just let it run? Yeah, let it run because this is more details that she gives us. I'm sorry, I guess I'm right. quite the far. The next on. step is the details. It will take about 20 minutes and we will sculpt on ears, on tails, slippers, legs, and perhaps. Uh, uh, Perhaps that, the wings perhaps. I call it a V technique. With a file in the middle of the head, we file a groove in the shape of a V. So this V will create a pair of ears. In the same fashion for the wolf, you can put your file right in the head of the wolf and try to do long strokes to make the ears appearing. Rinsed often, that always help. And the same fashion, you can start to put the details of the legs and you will do that for the bear as well. You start with a groove and then you will saw through right in the middle and then you create your pair of leg. The same way for the eagle, you will use that technique. You'll see with this technique that you can go very far. After knowing this technique, you will probably be able to carve uh, almost anything, I would say. And uh, here I have the seal, and we can use that for the flippers. And also for the tail, we will create also a V-shape to create the tail shape as well. In my hand, this is the orca, the same way as we did for the seal. Again, I hold it with the tail away from my hand and I create the groove slowly in the middle of my stone. And I groove and I groove and I go down quite deep to really design uh, a great, um, a great form that will very much define those uh, Najwa flippers in English, I would say. On the back of uh, the, the orca, there is also this kind of a V-shape, upside down V-shape you can uh, create to do the dorsal fin and that's gonna just look good you can work it from the side or from the top down you decide what works the best just remember this V shape and that will help a lot now for creating the tail this is very interesting and I will use my imagination to create this flippers that goes out and to do so I use my file as a measurement tool one and two I put my finger there at two and I start to shrink that part just at this level of my file and I do the same on the other side I do one and two for the length of two files and then I start to remove this kind of shape and that works very well. Again, you measure from the tip one and two and about there you start to remove 
the extra stone that you want to give to get in order to have a beautiful curvy tail. And that technique will work very well for your seal. And I would say that you can go all around and make it thinner as you wish, yet not so thin because it can break easily when it's very thin. So, and then it's a matter of you to decide how far you want to go with grooving this tail and making the curve. And you see, you can repeat the same with the seal. So that's uh, my technique. And you see from the begin, be beginning and the end how that differ. So have fun with that one. And that's another one that I have done, which is very technical. And if you have the vision, you can do it. I trust that very much so. And lastly, I want to talk about the eagle. The eagle is a very special one because we actually can engrave the wings. And to engrave the wings, I use the corner of my file. And I design it by curving my wrist naturally, like we are doing. And I design my wing. And so, and then when it's designed, I can decide to actually accentuate the wing with kind of feathers and different details as you wish. So that's the work is happening with the corner of your file and then you groove in front of the wing to actually make the wing stand out. So all in the front of the wings up to the chest you will remove the stone and the wing will start to really show as a relief type of sculpture. And that's about it. And at the back of the wing you can also create a groove in the same fashion with a v-shaped type of little groove to differentiate the pair of wing. So you can go deep. It's up to you to decide how far you want to go. And then make your, your animal quite round a lot and revisit corners and bring it to a shape that you wish to have. Don't be shy with removing the stone. You're going to have fun with that. So that's about all the details I wanted to talk. So this is uh, quite a bit of work, at least 20 minutes, and I trust you're going to have fun. Now, let's start. Okay, let's, can we pause there, yep. Chris? Yep. Paused. Thanks. How is everybody doing? Lots of thinking, I guess. Yeah. Well, busy hands, too. <laughs> is everybody having fun? I've got heads nodding over here. <laughs> I'm having fun. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions about what she had shared in the video about shaping or um, etching to create a line? Feel free to jump in at any point if any questions crop up for you.
And I'm sanding mine already. The red sandpaper. Huh? Well, we'll get to that in a little bit, but the red sandpaper is, is um, coarser. You start with the red and then you move to the yellow. I'm using the yellow first. Okay, that's the fine one that takes out all the scratches. all the scratches out. The red one takes out the scratches. Mm -hmm. The red and the yellow. Look how much soapstone I have. Mm -hmm. Remember to rinse your shape and your file often. And it's okay if your water is super uh, soapy from the soapstone, that's just fine. Um, 
you can just continue to use that water and uh, and just rinse often. A lot of that sediment will just drop to the bottom of your bowl. And then when you either water your plant or just toss it out in either the grass or the driveway, just make sure it's out of the way because it will leave that sediment wherever you toss it. Your, your file though to move your material. The sandpaper isn't going to move it as fast. take another minute or two to work on our project and then let's just take a moment to show them and just see how everybody's doing as they progress with their creature. Okay, it's okay if it's not done. It may not even be close to being done. That's just fine. Just do a little check-in and see how everybody's doing. Find out if there are any questions. <laughs> Sirsha and Brett, do you guys have your creatures? We're getting there. All right. Let's see. What do you, what do you let's see? Nice. Look at that wolf. That's great. Sirsha, oh, looking good. All right, but you guys have got great, those great pointy noses. Fantastic. Are you getting the shape in between? So for example, the front feet, are you getting that little sort of divide created there? Awesome. And how about the tail? I know that on the wolf, the tail sort of wraps around the, the one of the legs off to the side. Not there yet. Okay, no problem. <laughs> no problem. Thank you for sharing. Nora, would you share yours? Sure. This is what mine looks like. It's kind of hard to see because of the window behind me. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Oh, looking good. Very nice. Thank so you've you. got your, your leg shape in the front. Can you hold it a little yeah. higher? Very good. How about your backside, your tail? Is it wrapped around the... I did not make the tail yet. Okay. All right. I think that detail is, is included in one of the videos and it might actually be on your sheet as well. Let me take a peek at the wolf sheet. Yeah, so if you guys look carefully at, at peak number two on the nose, it sort of shows the longer to the body there. And you can see how the tail wraps around the back legs. Okay, those of you who are working on wolves. Okay. Nice work. How about Sarah and I'm sorry, I forgot your brother's name. Was it Jack or John? John. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Oh, look at that. I oh, see okay. critters. Very good. Oh, and look at that orca. It's looking fantastic. Very good. These are looking amazing, you guys. 
Yeah, my bear is starting to come together. It's getting, um, it's got its ear shape and the legs and starting to get that groove in between the legs. Now, if you want to put a tail on the back end, and I, maybe this was on the video, I don't remember. You take your the edge, you know how she was talking about etching. You do that same thing and you etch in a little V shape, right? Just like the story that, that Chris read, right? The, the bear lost its tail. And so now it just has a short tail. And so you can just make the shape of a V um, on its backside and kind of low as if it's pointing to that groove between its legs. You think that's in a video somewhere? I think I'm pretty sure I saw it in the video somewhere. Um, most of these guys are working on wolves though and oh, okay. orca. And orca. I think just my table that's working on the barrier. Um, there's one here about the dorsal fin. Did we want to go over that for the? We certainly could. Okay. Whoopsie. Stop. Uh, how to carve flippers? No. Here it is. Look, my bear's drinking. I'll mute out. What you'll want to do now is go in a downwards motion onto your fin. Make sure you use the tip of your fin. Don't allow the wings. Let's switch sides. So we're going to give you the links to all these videos and everything when we're done um, so that you can go back and watch if you want to watch again or if you were thinking about you want to order another kit or something. Uh, you know, remember that, remember, maybe you have figured out that we talked about that the, these kits came from Canada and you're hearing um, her French kind of Canadian accent as she's teaching us here, which is amazing. Um, so they do sometimes... Um, well, we ordered them from Canada. I'm not sure, Annalisa, if when you found them, did they come from Canada or were they probably in a in a U.S. gift shop, maybe? Or um, he got them for Christmas, oh, and okay. I just I just was looking at it and I was like, "Where is this company located?" <laughs> so that was kind of what prompted it all. Was mm -hmm. this is too cool? We need mm -hmm. to share this with Carver County folks, and yep. it's going so yeah. 
So on the website that we will share, they, there are all these videos that we've been looking at. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I can't remember if I'm still sharing or if you can still see what I'm doing here, but um, you can go back and look at them or see the other ones over and over again. I think something too to, is a little bit of the history, which we didn't talk a ton about. Um, but in some of the slides that we haven't, whoops, whoops, am I sharing? I'm not sharing. I will share the slides again. Ew. Yeah, we can look at the, um, at the, perfect. Yeah, the qualities of soapstone. So um, I'll just talk while you guys, how about that? I'll just do a little chatting while you guys carve. Um, so soapstone, as you found, is pretty soft. It's a metamorphic rock, primarily made of talc. I'm not sure if, if you caught that. She did say that, but she, you know, talc, and that's why it's so crumbly. Um, and talc is also what you, is chalk. Oh, I need to, my, it's not working. Here it is. There we go. Sorry, wasn't working there for a second. Um, non-porous, heat resistant, non-absorbent, and resistant to acids and bases. So there's your science lesson for today. I do think that I have heard that people are sometimes use soapstone as a countertop yes. in their kitchen. Exactly. It's used as countertops. And that's the beauty of it is because it's resistant to acids and bases. So for example, tomato juice or grape juice doesn't stain it and it doesn't etch it like it'll etch a lot of natural stone surfaces. This won't etch. It's, it's pretty impervious uh, to absorbing um, these these acids or bases or really anything and then you can see in the picture up above there's um, that wood stove and it's got soapstone surrounds what the soapstone and that's kind of as we were holding it in our hands you noticed it never really got warm well interestingly soapstone will take on after a significant amount of time the heat but it also releases that heat extremely slowly so it'll continue to warm your space for up to 24 hours. So it helps to uh, carry on or uh, continue uh, the heating effects of the wood stove. There you go. In other uses for the soapstone, not only in the wood burning stoves, but um, for marking sur surfaces, which is the tailors and carpenters and welders and um, Oh, there, natural stone kitchen counters. See, got ahead of myself. Carvings and sculpture. So you're telling me that this ginormous sculpture in Brazil, if I'm correct, this is the, the huge sculpture on the top of the hill. Is it Brazil? Yeah, where the Olympics yeah. were? Yeah, it's That they kept Rio. showing? That is yeah. made of soapstone. It is not entirely made of soapstone. However, it is covered in soapstone tiles. So the internal structure is metal and concrete, and then they have soapstone as the exterior of it. And it was locally mined there in Brazil. Um, unfortunately, that resource has been tapped out in Brazil. And so they, they're uh, having a challenging time finding tiles that will match that same color, that those same... Um, well, I mean, even just looking at yours, if you happen to have somebody next to you who's who's working with the kit too, just notice the different colors that are that are um, present in the soapstone, and um, and they show up just very differently. The one on the uh, Christ the Redeemer statue is gray, I think. It's, it's a very soft gray, and I'm finding that my bear has kind of a green hue to it, um, and so yeah, they, it comes in all kinds of colors. Nature, that's yeah, what we get so in cool. nature. <laughs> so soapstone's been used for thousands of years that we know of. Native Americans used it to make sculptures and cooking pots and probably for the same reason we just talked about. In the late archaic period, Native Americans from North America made bowls, smoking pipes, cooking plates and ornaments. During the stone age, Long, long, you know, back when I was born. During the Stone Age, people of Scandinavia used molded patterns of soapstone to pour metal objects like knife blades and spearheads. They discovered that they were able to heat the soapstone and spread it slowly into tools like cooking utensils, bowls, cooker liners, and cooking plates. Hmm. Who knew? 
yeah, cool stuff. <laughs> I told those stories. Yes, thank you. Is anybody getting to the point now where they're ready to start sanding? I'm just looking at the time and I see that we have a little over 15, have a little over 15 minutes left. And um, you don't have to be at that point. I just want to say, feel free to take as long as you need to complete your sculpture, okay? You're, you're not supposed to necessarily have it done within these two hours. So continue to shape it with your file. When you get satisfied with your shape, then you can begin to take your red sandpaper and then begin working over it. Now that takes out the big scratches from the file, all right? And then make sure you're, you do a very, very thorough job everywhere on your creature. After that, then you take your yellow sandpaper and that's a finer sandpaper and you continue to work over that, working out all of those scratches. And then once you feel completely satisfied with that, um, and I think we do have a slide on this too. Then you can bring in the wax. And this is on your, your care sheet too, or on your how to carve sheet that you received, okay? Then you take your wax. Um, but before that, you'll take a piece of uh, either foil or an old towel and set your soapstone creature on that. You'll heat your shape with your hair dryer for about two minutes. Because remember, soapstone is pretty impervious to heat. And so you want, you'll have to heat it just to warm it slightly. Then you'll take your wax and rub your wax all over your shape, okay? Then your bu buffing cloth is this little white piece of flannel here. And you'll begin to buff that wax and take off any extra wax debris on there. So make sure you get into all the little corners and all the little all the little bits that you have on your creature. And then you wanna let it cool, well, I'm sorry, you should let it cool completely before you begin that buffing process. Otherwise it'll just take all the wax off onto your cloth, okay? So follow your instruction sheet very carefully, all right? That's got all of the details here that you're going to need for, um, for your finishing process. Okay, and then I guess one helpful tool, let's see, does it say that? Yes, so on the sanding, instruction number four, on the sanding bit, make sure you dip your sandpaper in the water to help continue with that, that polishing effect. So water, as you can see, water is really, really important to working with soapstone. I don't know if, if it's as important in working with other stones, it may be, but clearly with soapstone, it's really vital to work with water on all of your tools, on your sandpaper. And then of course, to let that dry, um, I think before you even do your waxing portion would be an important thing to do. And then one other point, because soapstone is so soft, for example, Hayden received his eagle and part of the corner of the eagle's talon was chipped off. And so I wanna encourage you to be really careful with these because soapstone is soft. If you drop it, it can chip, you know, on those corners where the, the feet or the claws are, maybe a nose or an ear. So make sure that you uh, are really careful with your shape so that you're not dropping it, especially on a hard, for example, tile surface, okay? So make sure you tuck it into a safe place. We'll keep shaping here, keep working on your creature. Remember to turn it over, right? If you're working on one side and that you're looking at it, you're really liking how it's coming out, make sure you turn it over and you've got sort of a, a mirror image, if you will, of whatever that is on the other side to the best of your ability. So you can think about too, how are you gonna showcase this? Come summertime showcasing, or you could think about doing a demonstration with it um, if you were to get another kit, or you, you could do a little bit of history lesson along with, with it. Um, she mentioned the Inuit culture is where these particular um, 
icons, I think, are, are originally from. These are native from the Inuit culture on the West Coast. Am I right on that? Yes. Well, okay. I think the Inuit as well as the, um, uh, the Tlingit tribe um yeah there's quite a few tribes up there in the pacific northwest but the inuit is certainly um certainly probably the most well known so i think if you were to put a a, a display together with this or if you were to even talk about that you could talk about the history talk about where they where these come from you could maybe dive into the what we didn't talk about really um so much is is there symbolism for these animals and what what does the eagle represent or what does the wolf represent you know we talked about the wolf or the, you know we heard the story about the wolf and the fox we heard the story about a bear um we haven't heard a story about orca you know here in the midwest we wouldn't necessarily hear many stories about the orca but i wonder if there's any connections between native tribes and and histories and stories that are passed down from generation to generation that would be similar or different even. You know, what does the wolf represent in different cultures? So I think that would be a fun story or uh, a project to, to look into. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And on that same note, there is, um, well, there's some things that you can do. There's a little uh, contest that the uh, Studio Stone Creative is offering so that you can um, create a diorama for your creature. Okay, so you might want to create a scene and you can just take a shoe box and then create a scene around that with moss and little trees or whatever. And for example, I, since I've got my bear, I could place my bear up on a on a ledge or, or something inside my little diorama and then submit that as a project or a photograph to the Studio Stone Creative. And they actually, you get a free kit if you uh, submit that project. So Chris is putting up a picture here. You can kind of see there's a little a little example. I think that's a lion. It almost looks very Lion King-ish, right? How the lion is looking over <laughs> his domain below. Um, but you could create one in a scene that your creature would fit in and then take a photo of it, send it to Studio Stone. And I think if yours wins the drawing, then you get a free kit. And so that link will also be in that email that we send you so that you can pursue that further if that's what you choose to do. There is a deadline of March 31st. So that gives you, what, a week and a half um, to get that if you want to pursue that with the Studio Stone Creative. And then 4-H has decided to offer up a little, you'll win a, just a gift certificate. Um, if you want to create that same diorama and you can use the same one that's fine if you want to submit it to both and then you'll be put in a drawing for that in addition then you can take that diorama and submit that to the fair as one of your project areas so exploring animals for example otherwise your project or your carving could be submitted into the arts and crafts category or just the craft i guess category some of the the names of it have changed over the years um, and then I think there was another, wasn't there another category, Chris, that you could submit to? Uh, what did I decide? Well, and I was thinking too, um, the wildlife folks could could spin this and talk about the wildlife portion of the, oh, I didn't print it, my bad. Um, I do believe I put it on the, the activity sheet that I sent in the recent email. I believe I listed the projects that I thought um, could be entered. I think one was culture, I will find it because my memory does not work all the time. That's okay. <laughs> At the bottom of the activity sheet that you had for today, it should say things like, how can you bring this forward? there. Oh, there. Crafts 
projects, culture and wildlife hours. Yep. Um, the diorama thing I talked about demonstrations. Maybe you could teach a class to clover buds. You could take what you've learned or, or take some more, you know, and have this as an inspiration and, and maybe do some storytelling uh, for some clover buds at a meeting sometime, or we could make it into a county activity for clover buds. That would be fun. Um, I wonder if you, we don't, let's see. I think there's other counties that have like speech contests and you could do a speech on it. You could do a speech. I wonder in demonstrations, you could do an, informa an informative speech about the culture piece and the history and the maybe comparisons and the mm -hmm. different animals. Could even do it for school, I imagine. Absolutely. I don't know if any of you have ever been to the Bell Museum. The Bell Museum is a great place. If you're not quite sure what a diorama looks like, their website is fantastic if you haven't been there. And you can see some of the dioramas. So Jake Wees was an artist and a um, naturalist who created all of these dioramas. He painted them. And they're amazing. So it's like taking an animal and putting it in its natural habitat and kind of recreating that, you know, obviously behind glass. Um, but that might be a good spot to go to for inspiration on what to create for your creature. The museum is amazing too, but I, I and I think they're just beginning to open up again. Um, but if you're not sure, you could always look up their website and, and there are images there that show some of their dioramas and that could give you some, some inspiration for something that you may like to create. And that's right on the U of M campus, right? Bell Museum? Correct. I mean, they just, didn't they just opened a new, or they were opening a new space recently. And then I think the world imploded. Nora says she loves that place. Yes. I'm excited yeah. to, to check it out someday. Yeah. I, well, I worked there when it was the old museum on the Minneapolis oh. campus, um, but then it's now shifted over to the St. Paul and it's, I, I haven't been to the new one either, because just like you said, they practically open and then everything sort mm -hmm. of shut down. Nonetheless, so could, it's, it's a fantastic place for ideas. So you could really make a diorama in a shoe box or mm -hmm. whatever box you may have coming to your front door these days, any, any old box would do. So Definitely. you can use things that you have at home and paint and yeah. images from magazines, all kinds of stuff. So you could get creative and recycle and. Yep, exactly. Great suggestions. We've got about five minutes left, so I don't want to neglect the cleanup part. Okay. And we talked about it a little bit at the top of class or at this, the top of our meeting here. Um, and the important part to remember, well, first is your care of your little creature, right? After you, you finish it and just again, follow your sheet. It's got all the information that you need there to take you through to the sanding. Just make sure you wet your sandpapers, you continue to work it. Or start with your red, then move on to your yellow, right? That continues to polish and buff that surface. Let it wash, wipe it clean. You may want to get um, a bit of fresh water for that portion just to wipe it clean and, and then dry it. And then you can begin to heat it on a heat safe surface. So either a sheet of foil or on a, on a towel would be fine too. Heat your stone, rub your wax over it, let that cool. And then you buff it with your white cloth. And then for the cleanup portion, as that's resting and off to the side, you can clean up the mess that you've created. And so mostly I just have my paper here. I've got my file, I've got my very wet and soggy rag. And then I have my bowl full of extremely soap stony water. <laughs> so again, you wanna make sure you pour that into either a plant or you can discard it outside. Now make sure that your parents or you've asked your parents where they want you to discard that. So it's not gonna um, be in the way of anything or damage any plants that they may have coming up. It shouldn't, it's a natural, natural uh, mineral, so it shouldn't harm anything. But they just may not, it may not look so pretty for, for a little while <laughs> until it gets absorbed back into the earth, okay? And then once that your creature has cooled, you can buff that out um, and then take just a soft cloth, 
to clean up your surface. You might have a few soapstone splashes on your table surface that you've been working on. And um, yeah, it's pretty simple, pretty simple cleanup. The other thing I would recommend is because this file is still a very usable tool, um, you can tuck it back into your bag and then, uh, or I know that they arrived in baggies. Make sure it dries first before you put it in that baggie so it's not gonna uh, grow any curious organisms on it. And then set it in that bag and in, in your paper bag just to keep all your tools together. You can maintain your um, sandpaper if it's not shot. It's pretty small. You might find that it's not usable for much of anything else. Uh, but most of this stuff is recyclable or compostable. And you can uh, just add it to any remnants. Even if you've got paper down that's got the soapstone on it, you can just add that to your compost pile. Well, thanks everybody for joining us today.